it seems to be that Ukraine can't join NATO while there's a war on because that becomes the Third World War. So what really is on the table? What should be on the table, in your view? First of all, I don't agree that the war is imminent. It will a war already with us. I mean, the Third World War. And if you remember the... But it's not begun. You don't think the Third World War has begun, or do you? Uh, in a way, you're right. So if you're talking about nuclear, whether the nuclear is a sign of, of World War, that's different. But when you see how many nations are involved, how many nations are helping Ukraine, and how many nations Russia trying to reach out to get on their side. It's getting very close to the world war. And do you, does that mean, therefore, that Ukraine could join NATO while there are still Russian troops on Ukrainian soil? I can, I can imagine this because I remember what happened to Western Germany. The part of the nation was occupied and actually was invited into NATO. If you remember the Greece and, and Turkey were not in the best relationships when they were both invited, and so on and so forth. And also, don't forget that NATO has the specific area of responsibility, the area of responsibility, the, so it can be defined too. It is possible. And is it desirable? Do you want that? Would you like there to be uh, the unoccupied bits of Ukraine, Ukraine that is not currently having Russian, so the bits of the, the Ukraine that are currently free from Russian interference can join NATO? Would you like that to happen? We believe that Ukraine has to have the same umbrella of security as yourself or as many other nations, all 31. That's the, the, the whole extent of our, our beliefs and our desires. We just wanted to be able to develop in a way we want to, you know, build something without fear that the Russians will come and destroy it again and again and again. But you're right to put this question. We'd love to have the Ukraine united as a new member of EU and, and, and NATO in this case. Even before Russians are kicked out entirely from Ukraine? We have to start negotiations. That's what we are doing right now. And don't forget that 2008, we've been promised that we will become now is the moment of truth, whether we are becoming a member of NATO or not. If we are very formally, Ukraine belongs to the region, there are just two, two preconditions. Whether the nation belongs to the regions, Ukraine belongs to the European region, and whether they want the particular nation want to be a donor of security. Who's fighting the arch enemy of, of NATO? On the Ukraine only. So I believe that we are very much qualified to become a member of NATO. Cluster bombs are an issue that have uh, gained a, a, a certain amount of attention. They've been offered to Ukraine by the US. The UK has signed a treaty along with lots of other Western countries that they will never use or supply uh, cluster bombs. Um, does Ukraine want cluster bombs from America? Will Ukraine use cluster bombs in its war against uh, Russia? We are about to have them. I guess its decision is there. We are going to use it on our own territory, so we're quite aware of the risks of using the cluster munition. And don't forget that Russians are using the cluster munitions for the day one of the war. They never flinched. They, they, they used everything they have, the phosphorus bombs, you know, everything, just to get us out of our own lands. So we, we understand it. And also, the Russian, Russian cluster bombs are actually living so many fractions, so many of these bomblets, uh, after, after the use. In comparison, the American ones, they are much more sophisticated. Only 1.2%, if I'm not mistaken, of those ones who fell from, from sky will want one blast. So, so the, the reason not to have them is, is much less than the Russians use them. But are you willing to say that you will never use them inappropriately? They'll never... Because the problem with cluster bombs, the reason why you're concerned about Russians using them, if you use them in a built-up area, if you use them where there are civilians, if you use them away from military targets, it's a war crime. They, they are indiscriminate weapons of damage that can harm individuals who aren't engaged in, in warfare. Can Ukraine say, we will not do that? We will, we will never use them inappropriately? First, we already said so. We made clear that we won't use them in, in occupied areas. I mean, in occupied in, in the civil, civilian way. So only in the battle of, in battlefields. And the second one, that we will only use it on our own territory. We're not going to use it over the border between Ukraine and Russian Federation. Do you feel confident, Vadim? Because you know, the, the fog of war is a real thing. You guys are fighting for your lives. And Russian war crimes are well documented. Are you confident always in the conduct of war by Ukrainians? I would love to be uh, confident that we are doing everything according to the book. But at the same time, I understand what you're saying about the fog of war, that everything is happening. But we have to remind constantly our soldiers that to kill dragon, you have to be very careful not to turn into dragon yourself. We are quite aware, and that's what our, not just doctrine, that's our, you know, overarching sort of effort of all our commanders and political leadership. And 
you are confident that that's the intention, but you you are pragmatic enough to recognize that that might not always be the execution. We are prosecuting people who are who are I don't know, for many different reasons, and I can understand the psychological reason to go berserk when you just lost all your friends and family and something. And we have in in the, I remember the story when a lady went to war because she lost everybody's son and husband in the war, so she became soldier herself. This sort of people they they very difficult to stop when they want to you know, inflict much of the of the. Uh, on the, on an enemy. Yeah, I understand that. And um, just finally, uh, Vadim, there was that moment, wasn't there, three weeks ago when when Prigozhin was marching towards Moscow. There was talk, maybe Putin is, is wobbling, maybe this is the beginning of the end of, of Putin. Did that actually? Has that affected morale that that didn't happen? What's your view of it now? There's a bit of a bit of distance, a bit of time and distance. In, in a way, Russian Federation lacks this, you know, uh, sort of safety mechanism, which will allow them to get out of the situation when it's get, go, going too too far, and that's what happened with them. The, the the state, in most of the cases, is destroyed from within. That's what we saw by by Prigozhin's march towards Moscow, and look at the people who were hailing them like like uh, like rock star in the Rostov and Don, or this military who decided not to engage, allowing him to to get closer to Moscow, two hundred kilometers, three hours drive. So we understand that the, the, the conditions are almost right for somebody like Prigozhin to, to challenge the power of Putin. And sooner or later it will happen. Do you think? Whether we will push them out of our lands, that will be the end of our story, but they will have to go through very painful sort of reorientation of their own state, of their own idea.